it going? Good, how you doing today? What do we got here? I got a pest collection I'm looking to unload today. Got any candy? No, these have no candy in them at all. These are all from the 1960s, 1970s. What good are candy dispensers without candy? Come on, man, you work with this guy. I'm coming to the pawn shop today to try to sell some of my uh, Pez collection. I like Pez collecting because they're pretty cool. I mean, it's real Americana. You know, like baseball cards or Barbie dolls, G.I. Joe dolls. It's just fun collecting them. These are very, very collectible, and it's a great hobby. Seems like this is something that kids would be into collecting, man. Come on, man. Busting my balls all day long. I know it might look childish to you, but there's definitely money into it. I have Casper the Friendly Ghost in the original box from the 1960s. This uh, particular Pez here goes for like three to $400. I have the Mickey Mouse in the original box. It's a die cut piece here. It goes for about $350, $400. One of my coolest pieces I like is the original Batman. Very tough to find. You know, this goes for about $250, $300. We got Bozo, Tinker Bell, a Zorro. The 50 pieces that I'm bringing in today uh, worth about $5,000. Such a big collector, man. Why are you looking to sell them? Well, to be honest with you, a lot of these are my doubles. Okay. And I just want to unload them. Okay. So I can make money on them and... Uh, buy more Pez, obviously. Buy more Pez, definitely. Okay. More rare ones. I'm definitely interested in these Pez dispensers. I mean, there's a huge community out there of people who collect these things online. My only problem is that there's so many people out there buying and selling these things already that I need to get them really cheap. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to sell them. What do we want for them? I'd like to grab 2500 for them. I had to grab it somewhere else. I'm gonna offer you a grand, my friend, just because I gotta resell them. You could put these on the internet individually and uh, definitely make your money back on these. Well, man, I'm not looking to break even at all. I put them on the internet, next thing you know, I'm competing with five other guys selling the same Pez. I understand that, but these three pieces alone are Gino. Yeah. These three pieces alone. Give me 2,000, man. 1,000 bucks is what I can do. It's fine. All right, buddy, get out of here, man. I can't believe one of them guys offered me $1,000 for that them 50 pieces of Pez. That's an insult to the Pez community. I can't believe it. That's why they're chooches. Hey, how's it going? Good. What do we have here? It's a Smarties dispenser machine. Smarties, uh, the chocolate candy from Europe. Everyone in England eats Smarties. Really? Make a candy here called Smarties, too, but it's different, right? But like Pez, you know? OK. Well, Pez ain't bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming into the shop today to sell my Smarties candy dispenser. You would put a penny in and you'd take a game of chance and flick the ball around, and if you were lucky enough, you'd win some candy. Uh, I'd like to sell the machine today because I'm a musician and I could use the money for some new equipment. This is really cool. Do you have any idea how old this thing is? I'm thinking it's probably right about the beginning of World War II in that era, maybe, something like that. OK. Win a Smarties delicious chocolate. So do you get anything if it lands in the bottom? No, to land perfectly, to come around this thing and land in there. But I don't know if it shot a tube out or just individual Smarties candies, like you got three or four okay. or something. Is it, does it open up? Or? Sure. All right, here we go. Does it work? I think the main reason it doesn't work is because the graphics impede the ball from coming through the places it needs to come through. I'm surprised it doesn't hold more candy because and well, generally that's why I'm wondering, was it a dispensing machine for a money-making operation? It could have been one of the gambling devices they used that was supposed to give out Smarties, but when you went to the bar to get your Smarties, they gave you cash instead. Um, do you know what I'm saying? I think that's the way they do it in Louisiana still, I think. <laughs> <laughs> This thing is another example of a gambling device trying to masquerade as something else. And it would pay out candy, but you would trade your candy for cash at the counter or the bar. It was sort of legal. <laughs> so you want to sell it? I would like to. So how much you want for it? 2000 Based on the different machines and mechanisms I've seen that were close to something like this. Just let me have my buddy come down and take a look at it. Sure. Hold on a minute. I'll give him a call and get him down here. All right? Thanks. I don't mind an expert coming in to look at the machine. I've had trouble finding out information about it. It'd be fun to see what, what the thing really is. Smarties? Ooh, Smarties. In the United States, it's called the British Wall Machine. In Britain and Europe, it's called an all-win. The reason why, you count, you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven chances to win and one chance to lose. So, hey, I'm going to win. OK. It's a cool-looking machine. 
This thing isn't in bad shape. Of course, the graphics are shot. The front door is missing for the cash box. Uh, the graphics can be recreated. The cash box would be a problem because you're going to have to match the same patina here. OK. How much would it cost me to get it restored? I, I wouldn't restore it. I would just fix the graphics, OK? But you're talking 250 in that area to do the graphics. OK. So what do these go for? Looks really cool, don't it? Looks like it would go for a ton of money. You'd love to have it on your wall. No. <laughs> <laughs> you can buy them in England for about three, four hundred dollars in this comparable shape. Okay, pretty. Maybe good. seven, eight hundred dollars done. Okay. Thanks, Ben. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank nice you. to meet you. Thank you. If Rick negotiates a deal on this, I don't know if it's really going to be worth it. It's it's a tough thing. I tell you the truth. The owner probably would be better off just hanging it on his wall. And it, it's a nice looking piece. I, I'd be thrilled to have one on my wall. I, this, is a, this is a problem we have. We have um, something that sell, doesn't sell for a lot of money, that's not in great shape. And you know, Bob was just here. He's going to charge me $350 to fix it up, make it pretty and resellable, so I can maybe get 700 bucks out of it. Basically, it's not worth my time. All right. OK? Thanks for coming in, though. Thank you for looking at it. I'm not surprised at the value, but I'm very disappointed. I think I will take the time to restore that machine. I think it would be a beautiful addition to my junk wall. Hey, how's it going? Hey, how are you doing today? So what do we got? Well, we have uh, the original box and everything else with the Empire Strikes Back candy dispensers. Man, I know Star Wars merchandise is popular, but I just can't seem to get away from this stuff. They've tried to get me to sit down and watch a Star Wars movie. I've never been able to do it. Killing me. Do you mind if I open it up? I don't mind. Go ahead. I have no idea who that is. <laughs> and then, of course, Yoda is obviously Yoda. the most popular. That's why there's the most in the box. Before we even get started on negotiating on this, the first thing we're going to have to do is agree go in to see the movie together. I'll buy the popcorn. Uh, you know what? I'm not going to go see it. You're just not going to. Just like I'm not going to eat this candy. <laughs> I'm at the pawn shop today to try and sell my Star Wars Empire Strikes Back candy dispensers. This box is very collectible because it's a full set. The candy, none of them have been touched at all. They've been in the box, in the closet since the 80s, and I think I would be comfortable around 180. This is interesting. So where'd you get it? When it first came out, most stores sell them one piece at a time. I wanted to buy the full box. I bought it myself, and I kept it in my collection. So you bought a box of candy and didn't eat any? I never ate it, I know. Yeah, I mean, the film came out in 1980, and you know, after the first one, of course, it was a smash hit. Right. I just find it like crazy how valuable this franchise is. Yeah. Disney bought it from George Lucas for $4 billion, Yeah. and they made that off the first new movie that they made. I mean, they look like they were in really good condition. Uh, I mean, so what are they, like little knockoff Pez dispensers? You turn the bottom, and uh, it kind of cracks the seal, and then the little candy comes out. So uh, what are you looking to do with it? I'd like to sell it. I have identical twins that are newborns, and uh, we need diapers and formula. What are you looking to get? For you today, 180, I was thinking. Well, thank you so much for offering <laughs> me such a deal. Um, Here's the thing. I haven't failed on a Star Wars item yet. I've always made money on them. Yeah. But it is a knockoff Pez dispenser, as far as I'm concerned. But it is tops as well. You know, it's kind of a weird item, especially because I don't know who, other than Yoda, the rest of these guys are. Yeah. I'll tell you what. Let me get a buddy of mine down here to take a look at it. OK. And uh, maybe you can shed some light and see what it's actually worth. Let's do it. All right, I'll be right back. OK. So this is it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> It's a Yoda and three guys from Star Wars candy dispenser thing. Yep, Topps, uh, they've done so well with the cards from Star Wars. So anything they could latch on and produce that was Star Wars related merchandise, they would do it. Yeah, I mean, to me, it just kind of seems like a knockoff Pez dispenser. <laughs> it kind of was. And you got to think, like, that's the biggest form of flattery is copying something, right? So if Pez is doing it right, this has got to work. Do you mind if I uh, take a look at them? I don't mind at all. Box looks nice, and uh, you notice that the perforation right here is unpunched. What you would do is you would actually fold that up, and that would be your display, which that's your calling card. So when that is pointed towards you as a kid, you had to have one of these. 
It's a unique set. Um, what's really unique about it is that they were trying to latch on to some of the Empire Strikes Back characters that might not have been as recognizable. So they knew Yoda was gonna be an absolute hit, but the rest of the characters, it's kind of an odd group. You have 2-1-B, which is the droid that's here, and he's really in one really small scene. He's reattaching Luke's hand after Luke gets his hand cut off. This is the Tauntaun. The Tauntaun was a big part of the snow portion of Empire Strikes Back. I know I gotta explain this for you because you haven't seen Star Wars. <laughs> and uh, you have the bounty hunter Bosk. Bosk actually has quite a collector and fan base now. You know, I I'll tell you this, it's a neat set and it's, you know, from a fan standpoint, it's an incredible merchandising piece from Star Wars that you don't see every day. This is gonna draw a premium. You're gonna be able to get the upwards of $200 for this box. Okay, um, I appreciate you coming down, man. Yeah, no problem. Good Thank luck. you, thank you, I appreciate it. I know you're looking for 180. I know you heard Steve say it's worth 200 bucks, but I'd like to make more than $20 off a 40-year-old box of candy. Um, how about 120? How about uh, more diapers at 150? Yeah, it's just gonna be a little bit too much for me. Okay. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll go 140. I guess uh, I, I think I could do 140 today. Cool. Why don't you meet me over there? We gotta do some paperwork. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. With the $140 that I made, Papa's buying diapers and formula. That's what I'm doing today. Ghirardelli chocolate. Yeah, it's an old billboard. Sweet. I think it's pronounced Gahara Deli. No, it's not. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming into the shop today to sell my Ghirardelli chocolate billboard from 1918. It's a double-sided billboard that hung outside the famous Ghirardelli building in San Francisco, California. I think it's an incredible piece, and I'd like to see what it's worth. Where did you get this? Well, there was a night guard at the Ghirardelli building back in the 20s and 30s that was asked to clean out the maintenance closets. And when he was cleaning them out, he found this. That's neat, uh, Ghirardelli chocolate. This guy showed up before the people on the East Coast showed up for the, uh, gold rush in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. But he was one of the smart people. He didn't pan for gold. Uh, he ended up opening um, general stores. But he did eventually open up a little chocolate place, and which turned into a bigger chocolate place and a bigger chocolate place. And it just kept on getting bigger and bigger. But they still make some incredible chocolate. And they, got, they still have that whole Ghirardelli Square down in um, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So what do you know about it? Well, I know it's an old hand-painted billboard. It was hand-painted by the Universal Sign Company of San Francisco. But if we can flip this around, I can show you what I think is the better side. OK. I'll show. Yeah, Say Gahara Deli. You bring up a really good point. The company noticed that people could not find his product. So he decided around 1915 to launch a national ad campaign that just spelled it out exactly, Gear R Deli. OK. Gear Deli, or Gahara Deli, as Chum likes to call it, was started over 160 years ago. And the reason Gear Deli got so big is they understood advertising. In the late 1800s, they hired some great artists, and everyone in the West knew about Gear Deli chocolate. So I'm assuming you want to sell it. Yes. OK. And how much do you want for it? Uh, 18500 OK, and how did you come up with that price? I researched genuine chocolate collectibles, and I found that the vast majority of them are reproductions. All right. Here's my big problem. It's made on plywood. Exterior structural plywood came out in 1938. OK. So we're probably looking 40s or 50s art. It's really cool, but it's not, I don't think it's got the date for it. I'd give you like 700 bucks, but I don't think you're gonna take it. No, the lowest I would go is about $4,000. Thanks for bringing it in, though. Thank you. All right. I'm not buying the whole gear or deli thing. <laughs> I'm gonna take the billboard home, and I'm gonna find a collector who appreciates this for its true value. What do we got here? <laughs> I have some M&M bag displays. All right, where'd you get them? So I actually used to work at a candy shop. And then it closed down, and the boss said that I could take anything I want in the store. 
So I'm assuming there was just bags of M&Ms in there and you reach in there and grab one? Yeah, that's what we used them for displays and got a lot of attention. Okay. They really are cute. <laughs> I'm here at the pawn shop today to sell my M&M store displays. These displays really caught my attention. So I especially like the green ones, eyebrows. M&M's is really big, and I know that a lot of people like to collect these kind of things. I'm hoping to get $400 for my M&M displays today, but the way they kind of clutter my house, there's some leeway. Pretty cool, M&M's. Uh, you know the history of M&M's? Not really, no. Okay, so back in the day, Forrest Mars, Mars Candy, was in England, and he found out people loved a candy called Smarties. They were chocolate with a hard sugar coating around them, and people liked them because it took a much higher temperature to melt them, okay? Because oh. chocolate, you know, let's face it, you just put it in your hand, and it starts getting gooey. Mm -hmm. So he came up with his own process of putting the sugar shell around the chocolate, but he ended up partnering up with a guy named Murray, and they started making M&Ms for Mars and Murray. They ended up selling M&Ms to the military, shipped them to the troops all during World War II. Soldiers fell in love with M&Ms. Right after World War II, Mars started selling M&Ms in stores, and they just became basically an American favorite. When I was a kid, there was just peanut M&Ms and plain M&Ms. Now there's like birthday cake, caramel, pumpkin spice latte. I mean, there's like 40 or 50 flavors. And like, they were so popular, eventually they came up with these characters and it's been a great marketing campaign for them. M&Ms are just kind of Americana. How much you want for them? So I was looking up online and I was seeing them going for about 200 each, so 400 for the pair. You know, I have an employee, he's got a candy store right across the parking lot. He might be able to use them. So I'll give you a hundred bucks a piece. Could you do maybe like 350? Do you really want to put these back in your car? You got me there. I guess we have a deal. So 200 bucks? 200 bucks. Okay, I'll meet you right over there and I'll get you paid. Okay, thank you. Even though I didn't get the 400 that I asked for, I think 200 is still a pretty sweet deal. Oh man, what is that? It is an old Wrigley's gum vending machine. Okay, um, I'm assuming it took a nickel? Yeah, it looks <laughs> like it did. That's about all I can figure out. Yeah, and Double Mint probably was their most popular gum. Uh, they won awards for the jingle, Double the Fun. Everybody remembers the twins, and coincidentally, but there's two <laughs> twins right there. I came to the pawn shop today because I wanted to sell my vintage Wrigley gum dispenser. I've been a Wrigley Juicy Fruit fan my whole life. My granddad actually kept a pack in his pocket, uh, so it brings back some memories for me. I'm looking to get 500 bucks for it. I mean, everybody knows Wrigley's gum. Somebody's gotta be out there that finds something like this valuable and wants to buy it. That's cool. Where in the world did you get this? Actually, my granddad was kind of a pack rat back in the day. And when he passed away, we went through his garage and he had about a million old things like this. And this one looked kind of cool, so I kept it for myself. And the Wrigley Company is the world's largest maker of gum, period. It was like in the 1890s, William Wrigley moved to Chicago and he was actually selling soap, but in order to get people to buy the soap, he was giving them free pieces of bubble gum. The funny thing was is that his gum was more popular than his soap, so he stopped the soap and just started selling the gum. Um, what do you want to do with it, man? I want to sell it. You have any idea of what you're looking to get out of it? Well, I was hoping to get $500 if that's possible. Uh, you know, we all got a dream, man. Goals are not a bad thing. Um, but 500 bucks for this, I mean, there, there's no way. Here's what I'm gonna tell you, buddy. There was millions of these things created, and you'd have to almost give it to me for free, and what I would pay for it, would I'd almost break even restoring it. Are uh, you sure you can't make me an offer? I mean, it seems it's really old. Somebody might find some use out of it. But, I mean, there's just, there's no money here. All right. All right, man, take care. Thank you. I was a little bit upset. I came in here thinking he was gonna make me an offer, thinking that there's somebody out there who will buy it. Should have been valuable to him. I absolutely think he is making a mistake by letting me walk out of that door with that vending machine. Hey, how's it going? Hey, good, how you doing, man? I'd like to sell this item here today. Select Van candy and the gum dispensing machine. All right. Hey, chum, if you own a candy store, come take a look at this. Guy's got a candy machine. You know I love candy, big hoss. Yes, I do. I'm here at the pawn shop today to sell my Selecto Van candy and gum machine. I got this machine from my neighbor. He was having a garage sale. It was from the 1940s, and it's in decent condition. I was hoping to get $225 for it today. 
This is pretty cool, man. You know, the first vending machines were actually used at post offices and train stations, and they were for postcards. And then somebody said, oh, that's a really good idea. I should do one, but have candy in it. Or I should do one and have drinks in it. Now, I think in Japan, there's a car vending machine. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, right. You know, Selectovin, it wasn't the biggest company out there, but they were around for a long time. Especially like these little small ones, they were almost everywhere. Let's take a look at it here. This would have came out around 1945, and it would have been one of the earlier vending machines where candy was dispensed out of. But it was the only penny candy machine that they actually made in this size. It's nice that it's small, it can sit right up on the counter. You could pretty much put this anywhere. The kind of candy you'd find in here would be the penny candies, bite-sized snacks, and simple to use. Turn this to where you want, put your penny in, and pull the lever. Out comes your pack of gum, and there goes away your bad breath. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever opened it up before? Uh, no, I have not. Let's see. There we go. Normally, there would have been a key right here, and you would have had to unlock it. That's missing. That's easily replaced. But it's a pretty basic, simple mechanism. Just this one thing that turns, and then when you pull this, push the penny in. Overall, it's, it's in fair condition. It's got a ding up here, and a collector probably would want to get this ding taken out, sandblast it down, and repaint it. So what are you looking to do with it? I was actually looking to sell it today. OK, uh, how much are you looking to get? It's a piece of history. I was looking to at least get 225. Uh, I'd offer you about 50 bucks. 125? I'll go 75 bucks. That's the most I can do. Um, OK, All right, I'll cool. do 75. Come meet me over there. I'll write you up. Sounds good. All right, I can use this in the candy shop.